What's up guys and welcome to another chat today with a good friend of mine, a fellow Canuck, Alex. <laughs> and uh, Hi. how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Daniel. Thank you for having me on the program. Yeah, my pleasure, my pleasure. Um, so today we're going to be talking about uh, Huawei and specifically the Meng Wanzhou case. Um, this is something that I had been following closely in the beginning, but it's just, you know, there's too, there's too many things to pay attention to these days, isn't there? And mm -hmm. I think um, uh, it, that, that's perhaps what uh, people hope for, is that people are kind of looking the other way. But I think it's really important to still uh, really pay attention to what's going on because it is quite shocking. So what we're going to do here is you're far more familiar with this than me because you've been continuing to follow it. But I, I will start off with some of the things that I saw in the beginning. And then you can kind of fill in the gaps and uh, uh, add your parts uh, after I'm uh, finished. Are you, you okay with that? Yeah, it sounds great to me. Yeah, okay, okay. So uh, what was interesting for me in the beginning was um, one of the initial premises of uh, grabbing uh, Meng Wanzhou in Canada was the trade with Iran through um, uh, through Sky, uh, Skycom, was it? it was, uh, Skycom, yes. Skycom. And um, the basic premise of dealing with Iran didn't meet the requirements to have um, an extradition case in Canada on that element itself, because Canada has trade relations with Iran. Um, so that was the first thing I was like, well, well what's, go what's going on here? Um, <laughs> then obviously the second piece was the, uh, the fraud piece, saying that she misrepresented uh, the fact that there was a relationship between Skycom and Huawei. And, and then you look into it and you're saying all of the employees who were communicating with HSBC had a Huawei email address. It's like they weren't really trying to hide it. And then the PowerPoint presentation that the um, prosecution presented, they took out all of the slides that had very direct references to Huawei to say, you see, you were misrepresenting. It's like, well, well, hold on a second. Where are these missing slides? So they're, they're very definitely and deliberately trying to dishonestly create um, a, a case against her. And then, of course, the final piece is that they didn't request that it be done in U.S. dollar, because obviously this is all based on the fact that the transaction was done in U.S. dollars. And um, the U.S. does a very good job of weaponizing the U.S. dollar to punish uh, uh, not only their enemies, but their allies also. This is their form of uh, kind of a global control. But the slide, one of the slides also mentioned that there was no requirement for U.S. dollars and that they didn't need it to be in U.S. dollars. So now that's very curious. HSBC chose by themselves to use the U.S. dollar. Then they conveniently leaked all of this information over to the U.S. to say, hey, OK, here you go. It's almost like they handed a setup a silver platter to the uh, U.S. And um, I started kind of digging into it a little bit deeper. This isn't the first time the U.S. has done something like this. Obviously, they've done this to their own ally France before with Alstom, where they grabbed a, uh, they grabbed an executive, and uh, that thing only really cleared itself up after Alstom, this massive uh, power uh, company in uh, in France, agreed to sell to an American company, GE. Surprise, surprise. Everything turned <laughs> out okay after that. Um, and I think that's an important thing to remember, too, is because when people on the sidelines are looking at this and say, well, you know what, they're going after China, whatever. No, they're going after China right now. They're coming after you next time as long as you do something big enough, as long as you do something that threatens uh, um, the U.S.'s uh, uh, power. Um, there were, uh, what, what, what else was there? There was a bunch of other things that came up, um, but I've kind of, it's kind of, uh, I've been following a lot of other stories, and mm -hmm. so that's why I'm very interested now to hear you kind of fill in the gaps uh, from that point of view and um, tell us a little bit more about what's been going on since then. Well, I, you know, let's back up a bit and let's, let's really have a look on how we got here. And, you know, this case has been going on for, you know, over two years now. This started in December 2018. Now, I want to clarify something when you were mentioning about, um, you know, HSBC's uh, connection to all of this. Now, let's look back at HSBC's recent litigation and legal action that was taken part by the Department of Justice in the United States. Um, for any big bank, uh, a $1.9 billion fine uh, is quite big. And uh, they got this during the first global, or we'll call it the recent uh, global financial meltdown, uh, you know, and during the housing crisis in the United States uh, around the 2008-2009. And HSBC said, okay, we'll cooperate, um, we'll pay the penalty, and we'll continue to cooperate. Now, what does that mean, continue to cooperate? 
Does it mean cooperate when it's convenient to the authorities in the United States of America? Or is it convenient when they feel that, you know, hey, uh, we have a bad client here? Now, uh, as you know, Huawei is a big company. Uh, Skycom, um, you know, its involvement in this is also very interesting. And, you know, you bring up the point about U.S. dollars. Um, to go into that, it's, it's quite extraordinary that uh, when you're mentioning uh, US, U.S. funds, is that there are certain stipulations in U.S. law that really go into detail about that. For example, wire fraud, electronic mail fraud, uh, all these things start to trigger when you use a U.S. currency. So if you're outside of that, then... The, you know, it falls out on, on other jurisdictions. But they thought, well, here we go. Uh, we can pinpoint it to the U.S. dollar. We can say that, uh, you know, this company has been trading with Iran. Uh, we've got a PowerPoint presentation. That's all we need. Let's bring charges. Um, let's also throw in a couple of uh, conspiracy charges there. And as you know, in the United States, conspiracy, it doesn't mean they have to prove that you tried to do it. It's just that if you were thinking about doing it. And that comes with a pretty hefty, uh, uh, pretty hefty jail sentence. But, you know, having said that, um, the U.S.'s uh, history, track, track record on this is normally if they're going to go after a corporation or a very large company like Huawei or Telecom or Bank, they normally charge the company. And the company gets charged and once again, like HSBC did, pays a decent fine and that fine was almost to the tune of 1.9 billion dollars so you can very easily source that out and and check that i mean it was it was big headline news when it was when it was yeah, coming out but but no one went to jail uh for that and you know it was a, a major fine now i just want to dig into uh this whole we're calling it can we can we agree that we're calling it a fraud case was that accurate <laughs> A, fr a, so, a fraudulent fraud case. A fraudulent fraud case. So we have a 25-page indictment from the Department of Justice. Very easy. I'm going to put that link in the description below, and anyone can have a read on it. It never once mentions in this 25 pages who was defrauded out of money. Right. It doesn't say anywhere. It has no value. It puts no value... Was the U.S. taxpayer defrauded? Was it the bank defrauded? Was the U.S. government defrauded? Were individuals defrauded? Were companies that were trading in between these uh, defrauded? Was someone in Iran defrauded? No one was defrauded. They have zero uh, value to that. So this is where uh, you know we. <laughs> this is where we're going with this case. That's that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, uh, mm -hmm. for a fraud case with no victim. Um, that's pretty that's that's how I'd like to say it I mean you know it's it was done in you know the the famous district court of the Eastern District of New York I mean uh, you you get quite a few high-profile cases down there but you know it, it does it does mention uh, Huawei technologies Huawei device Skycom and Ming directly uh, and you know it's it's quite it's 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 quite interesting, but the uh, the person that's uh, looking or has been defrauded is the United States District Court, Eastern District of New York. They're there, <laughs> so I mean it's not really mentioning uh, anyone else's name uh, who the victims are here. So we're off to a really interesting start here, Daniel. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it. It sounds like it. Um... And, and your understanding of what I mentioned before in terms of certain slides being taken out and everything like that in the beginning, uh, mm. you've been seeing the same thing, right? It's just a very carefully curated case um, with a specific goal and uh, truth and, and, and justice doesn't seem to be one of those things, one of those goals. Well, he, here, here's how it, you know, um, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not going to give legal advice. But I've seen enough of these cases in the research that I've been doing over the years, especially from, you know, uh, you know, investing in public companies. I do a lot of due diligence and you get your due diligence from the Security Exchange Commission there. They don't really have a, an arresting authority. They only can put, you know, uh, damages, uh, not criminal charges, but uh, they can just put civil charges and something like this should have. If, if there was damages, it should have fallen under the, uh, you know, the civil. But now this has gone to a criminal court and they needed to get an arrest warrant. So what they do, they put together a nice fancy indictment, 
25 pages, throw in a couple of hit pieces in there, and voila, you have an arrest warrant. A judge will sign off on it. And let's just look at the conviction rate in the United States government against uh, people. <laughs> it's uh, last time I last time I heard it was it was well over ninety percent. I'm hearing about ninety seven percent, but it's well over ninety percent that the U.S. government does win a majority. I would say ninety to ninety five percent of its cases. So uh, here we go. Yeah, and and you know I, I mean. <laughs> You hear that number and you think, oh, well, you know, there's, they have the rule of law in the U.S. and stuff like that. But we haven't dug into any of those other 97% cases uh, like we have on this one. And, and this is just no. the one we're digging into. And you see removing of slides before you present the evidence, um, the, the, the shoddy kind of arresting, which we'll talk about, which came up in the recent hearing also. Um, you know, it, it's like if this is any indication of how they do things, um, then we've got a lot to worry about. We, of course, have, uh, you know, I'm, I'll take a make a very small diversion here for a second. We, of course, have the Julian Assange case going on also, mm -hmm. which yep. is just as remarkable, which is just, you know, limited people have access to the courts. The one uh, person who was listed as family who's in, he was talking on the news the other day where he was saying that they go through all of this uh, information and they talk about um, the war crimes that were uh, uncovered by Julian Assange. And they don't care about the war crimes, of course, because no war criminals are being tried here. Um, and uh, then when the judge finishes hearing uh, the testimony, he takes out a piece of paper which already has whatever he needs to say written down on it and just says, word for word, this is, you know, okay, this, 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 this. It didn't take into consideration anything that was just said. Um, and and that's, re that's remarkable, too, is that uh, the whole case is also based on him uh, putting... Uh, <laughs> this is interesting, too. Putting U.S. Uh, kind of assets or whatever it is in danger. Um, mm -hmm. And when you want to really word that the correct way, he is being indicted for putting U.S. war criminals at in danger. So that's the first issue. Then the second issue is that the U.S. already did a, a, a study and nobody, mm -hmm. nobody was put in danger. Nobody was injured because of the information that Julian Assange put out also. But that's what the whole case is based on also, is the danger that he put these people into. So that's, I, I don't want to go too much off on a tangent here, but it's like it's happening at the same time. So we can kind of see when we're thinking about that 97%, this is, this is what's actually happening in those cases. Yeah, you know, it's... And I'm not going out and saying that all these corporations, you know, and massive uh, companies around the world are squeaky, uh, clean, and innocent. Uh, but normally, uh, you know, when these things happen, penalties and fines come down. Um, but nabbing the equivalent of, uh, you know, uh, putting, uh, you know, Tim Cook uh, under house arrest in a, let's say, Vietnam on a Russian. Uh, extradition warrant is about the equivalent here. That, that, that's <laughs> so, really well said. Could you imagine, honestly, could you imagine, yeah, if Tim Cook, he wasn't even going to Vietnam, he was just a transit flight through there, because that's yeah. what it was too. Mung Wanzhou was on his on way to Mexico, right? Yeah. Get, gets, into, gets into the airplane, grabs Tim Cook because Russia wants to extradite Tim Cook. Yeah. Honestly, that's, honestly that, that's, that's like an act of war. Like, what, what, what <laughs> But this is okay the other way. It's really unbelievable, and and then and then and then the other thing too is is when you look at it uh, in terms of the other way, even just the suggestion, even just the suggestion that the International Criminal Court wants to look into U.S. war crimes in Afghanistan. Mm. You know what the reaction was? Pompeo sanctioned the members of the International Court, not only them but their family members too. Their family members can't even go to the U.S. anymore. That's how, like, this is some serious, this is like the kind of um, things you usually hear about uh, North Korea, right? Which is like, mm -hmm. you will be punished and your family will be punished for your sins. That's exactly what the U.S. is doing when there's even a peep about talking about the war crimes in Afghanistan. And meanwhile, they're doing this, this kind of uh, 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 BS, holding people accountable that aren't from their jurisdiction, that have nothing to do with them. Um, that's the case for Meng Wanzhou, and that's also the case for Julian Assange, who's only ever been to the U.S. once in his life and never committed a crime in the U.S. and had nothing to do with it. It's remarkable, this show that we have going on in front of our eyes, and it's a great way yeah, to people are. And as you're saying that, I'm, I'm just uh, going through some of my notes here, and I just wanted to, you know, bring it up uh, that, you know, let's face it, Ming travels the world, <laughs> okay? She's got a very, very uh, serious position at the company of Huawei. Um, 
But what's interesting is this arrest warrant has been hanging around for a long time. It's been around for a while. And uh, here's what happened. She had traveled to 10, um, well, okay. The Americans were monitoring her movements for some time, okay? And between August and December, uh, they had noticed that she had visited six other countries uh, they were, that had extradition treaties with the uh, United States. One was Britain, Ireland, Japan, France, Poland, and Belgium. Um, and the thing is, is they had plenty of opportunity to arrest her in any of those countries, but right. didn't. And that's very strange. So they were monitoring her, and all these countries have extradition treaties with the United States of America. So, you know, with 10 countries to choose from, uh, you know, um, I guess it was Rob, Rob Robertstein, or Ro Rosenstein, Rosenstein, I think it's Rob Rosenstein, uh, uh, you know, basically, we're looking at uh, Canada is kind of like, hey, these guys are going to cooperate, no problem, let's get her on Canadian soil, and let's involve Canada in this. Well, you know what, actually, this brings so much more context to... Um, okay, you know that you know that show uh, Shark Tank or something like that, where people pitch their business ideas. Uh, Kevin yeah. O'Leary. Kevin O'Leary. Yes. He he did a video. Uh, he was he was being interviewed where he said, you know what? He said uh, the the U.S. knows that they're going to be having this trade war with China, and which is the country that is set to benefit the most from this? Canada potentially. You know, a lot of China's business could move up to Canada. So what do you do? You set this case up, and all of a sudden, China's pissed at Canada too. Now it's it's the perfect thing. And he said, he said, our government is absolutely useless. He said, what I would have done if, if I was uh, uh, the, the Canadian government, I would have got on the phone to, you know, called up the pilot uh, when they're on their way to, to Vancouver and said, hey, listen, you know, uh, there's, uh, we think you should actually just fly directly to your destination in Mexico. You know, we think, you know, and not, and not mention anything and just say that. I mean, people play politics like this. And can you imagine how much BS Canada could have avoided if they did that? Now maybe I don't know I don't know the legalities around that or whether the whether you talk about the uh, the more the morals behind doing that or not but man would that have saved Canada a lot of time and they could have won big from America choosing to get into this trade war with China so maybe that was actually well, intentional also where they say you know what we don't want to we don't want to push all this business up to Canada let's 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 drag them into our our mess while we're you know somehow while we're at it. I don't know. I mean, it could be something. Well, it gets more. It gets more complicated. If she would have went to Costa Rica or even Mexico, they still could have extradited her. Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 But we now kind of caught up in the me this mess. Correct. Now Canada's in this mess, and they're in it very deep. And here's the problem. Let's talk about how her arrest went down. When you're traveling to countries, uh, for example. Uh, you know, we you were you brought up earlier uh, the Julian Assange, uh, and we can also bring up Edward Snowden while we're at it because this is a also another extraordinary case. Now let's remember how the Edward Snowden case went down. He had flown over to Asia. Uh, he had uh, he was we'll call it in a safe house in Hong Kong. I believe that's true. Mm -hmm. Until they found him a country that uh, could give him you know safe harbor, so he decided to fly into. Moscow and uh, he stayed at the airport now remember where he was staying his his passport was revoked he was staying in the transfer area now technically most transfer areas in airports are kind of sovereign all right you technically don't go through border patrols you don't go you're actually not on that sovereign land you're in kind of we'll call it a gray area a gray zone and when you're through a transfer area, you never usually go through passport control because you're legally not coming into the country. You're transferring through it. Right. Wow, how <laughs> on earth, and this is the interesting part, and this is going to come up in the case here. How did Ming, or why did Ming, or who brought Ming to the point where she come off the plane and was in instructed to meet up with the Canadian Border Patrol and then be admitted to Canada to be arrested when she is actually transferring through Canada. Because so you, you know that... Was there coercion to get her to through customs? Like, just come with us, come with us first. And then... Listen, and then, yeah. if the, it, 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 this is what's under the cross-examination right now, okay? 
where they're they're examining the policemen or the the RCMP and the Canadian border. I mean, it's it's turning into a bit of a circus here. One of the uh, arresting officers said that it you know um, uh, you know out of security reasons uh, he felt that uh, he had to be very delicate that she did come off the plane because for you know security reasons. Now was Ming you know, head of one of the largest telecom companies in the world, a threat to people on board? Uh, did the they have some... Asked, wasn't it? They asked directly, yes. Do you really think a 40-year-old businesswoman of a multi-billion dollar company was going to come at you with a knife? Like, it's like... <laughs> but, you know, those questions were asked, and uh, there was deflection and deflection and deflection. But let's continue to go back. How did she get... How did she get from a transfer area of an international airport to being admitted into a country and uh, being held for three hours before Canadian authorities got there, then to be arrested by the Canadian authorities? And don't forget, these are countries that are, you know, you're allowed due process. You're allowed to get a lawyer. You're allowed to, if you're being arrested or if you're being detained. But we are talking about Canadian border agents who... Quasi had a, well, they didn't have the arrest warrant. The RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, had the arrest warrant, who were then being instructed from someone else. So it was tic-tac-toe. Okay, Meng's arrived. How are we going to put this together? Well, yeah, she's in an international transfer area. No problem. I've been traveling, what, 30 years? And I have been through transfer areas. You might have security check. Never seen border patrols never seen anything like that never been told hey sir where are you going well i'm you know i'm on my way to mexico we'll have a good day that just normally doesn't happen especially in canada i know you've flown through canada a few times or maybe even transferred through it um if you're coming into canada yes uh you 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 go through the procedures you grab your bags and then you meet a, a border patrol agent if they want to take you into questioning, they can do that. And then, if they feel that there's an arrest here, but we've got we've got basically some, this. You know, this was very well organized uh, before she was coming there. No, so there's we, we, we have the precedent to also show that the, the the Canada just does whatever the heck the U.S. does. Mm -hmm. They're just absolute puppets. It was in the '90s. Uh, it was in the '90s. Um, uh, Ali Muhammad. Uh, there was a guy, a terrorist, a Taliban connected terrorist. Also coming through Vancouver, uh, entered, uh, and they were—he was nabbed by the RCMP on fraudulent passports. Completely, a, a, a major top-end terrorist. We're talking mm -hmm. about here. Mm -hmm. And what happens? With the, the, what we should be doing is we should be saying this guy has fraudulent passports. This guy has broken the law. We need to take him in, and we need to go through the due process. Now, you know what happened? A quick call to the FBI. Uh, the guy made a quick call to the FBI, and, and they said, uh, "Yeah, he's one of our assets. Let him go. No problem. Let him go." There was no regard for law and process and anything then, so we're seeing this on the opposite end. Now, of course, that guy went on to uh, end up um, masterminding and also helping organize the embassy bombings, which ended up cu cu uh, killing dozens of people through uh, Africa and the Middle East area, I believe it was. Um, and finally, the U.S. nabbed him. But we're just, we're just, we're just like lap dogs to the U.S. And it's so, as Canadians, this is the thing that really kind of annoys me too: is that just over and over and over again, we do whatever they say. This isn't about yeah, it, my concern is the word sovereign, and I go back to that many times. Um, you know, whether this is a, a case with Meng, whether this is a case with you know other companies, uh, you know, this whole word extradition treaty with United States of America. Uh, you're really if let, let's look at this as an individual that doesn't have the financial wealth to actually uh, maintain this. Um, for example, two years under house arrest. Now, let's say an average person or contractor or someone that was picked up on similar charges to this wouldn't have a chance because uh, A, it would cost a tremendous amount of money to fight the case. B, if that wasn't their, uh, if they weren't even in their country where they could make a living, and it, you know, and I'm not trying to say that, uh, you know, uh, here we go, uh, you know, why should we feel sorry for you know a multi-billionaire uh, of a large telecom country, company? That's easy to to kind of just throw that out there and uh, yeah. say, well, why do we care? It's all about 
if this person didn't have the financial means to fight this case, they would have done a plea agreement. And that plea agreement, which most of these cases, sign on the dotted line, admit to your guilt, uh, you know, one year, three year, five year time in jail, and that's the end of the story. Yeah, or within the a case, lot of that. Sign your company over to GE, sell your company to GE, you know, whatever the goal is, the American uh, goal, yeah. So that that is, you know, every Canadian should be worried. And of course, you know, uh, we'll get to the, the two Michaels here in a bit here. Uh, you know, every Canadian should be concerned about that case too. But yeah. on, on, on the surface here, as, as Canadians, we got to be really concerned here because we can fly into our own airport in our own country and someone and our authorities, our border patrol authorities, our, our uh, you know, our Canadian, uh, you know, mounted police, uh, our legal system can be dictated by a country uh, just by a phone call because that is clearly where this case is starting to set out. There is a connection. It's not like she arrived in Vancouver and they're like, oh, um, that's Meng. Um, let's look through the files. No, no, no. They knew she was on the plane. The Americans were, were, were putting this together. And here is, here is the one most disturbing thing is that the legal team, the defense team for uh, Meng requested the communications between these um, between these uh, these uh, authorities, uh, the FBI and uh, you know the Canadian RCMP, they requested them and they were denied it. They were denied this information based on national security. This is somebody trying to defend themselves from staying out of prison for almost seventy years if convicted, that they will not, uh, you know bring over you know they will not hand over the information to the defense team that is absolutely i've never seen anything like that and and this yeah go ahead this was uh this was the canadian security intelligence services they they've got the keys to all of this and this this lady should have been walking a long time ago but uh i digress <laughs> you know um yeah and and, and i mean the, the the thing we have to look at too um I mean, well, that, that's first of all remarkable, yeah, on national security. It, there's an irony there where <clears throat> everything that uh, Hong Kong was criticized for, uh, extradition bill, national security, because they're afraid they're going to misuse it, America is actually misusing it today. Their extradition bill, um, their uh, national security laws and all that kind of stuff. And, and so meanwhile in Hong Kong, the guy who killed his girlfriend in, uh, in, 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 in uh, Taiwan and, and put her in a suitcase can no longer be extradited to uh, Taiwan. Um, but. Here we have everybody saying, this is something we should be scared of in Hong Kong, while this is actually going on with the US. I think, I think it's really important too, though, to talk about the motive here too, um, because this is something that I've always thought, of, uh, thought about too. Um, and I think it's clear, I mean, Huawei is basically just killing it. They're, they're doing, they're, they're, they're building networks around the world and everything like that. Um, and the US keeps talking about these backdoors, which they've never proved exists. Uh, you know, even Microsoft came out and said, you can't just say this, you have to actually provide evidence and, and, they're, they're, and, the, and the Microsoft executives were saying, this is not how our system is supposed to work. But whatever. What's, what, what's at risk? They've already well, uncovered I that Crypto AG, you know, Crypto AG, the Swiss company mm -hmm. that's uh, providing telecommunications equipment and software, it has direct connections to the CIA. And we know that the, 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 there was actual malware found and everything like that. And we know that the U.S. uses their, their abilities to, to link into these communication systems to spy on their own allies like the German Chancellor and everything like that. All the things they're saying that Huawei will potentially do without proving that there's a backdoor while actually doing the things that they're saying the Chinese will eventually do um, is a very important point because that's what's at risk. What's at risk is the U.S. is uh, uh, losing their ability to basically control the world, spy on whoever they want, tap into anybody's phone they want, uh, if all of a sudden it's not their infrastructure that's in, in place around the world. That's my perspective. That's my theory on a possible motive. I don't know if you've it, got other, it, you know. It's interesting how you mentioned that. And I'm going to bring up a company that um, has really shifted its business. And um, we know how the telecom game works. It's it's a massive business, okay? It's a it's an absolute massive business. Whether it's in hardware, software, um, 
whether it's in applications, you know, it's always evolving and there's always, you know, I think the telecom companies in general like working with telecom companies, you know, you got the Qualcomm's and the, you know, all these uh, people selling chips and ARM and all these people together. But here's something that comes right back to our backyard. It's a company called BlackBerry and they were one of the most, yeah, they were one of the most secure mobiles, uh, net, or, well, they were one of the most secure mobiles on the planet. Obama was even using his. Remember when he got elected? He, did, he said, I want to keep using my BlackBerry, <laughs> right? And this all came up when Edward Snowden divulged that this is one device that couldn't be cracked. They tried. It showed the internal notes. Um, it's quite an extraordinary visit. It says, uh-oh, a BlackBerry. And it was one of the only mobile devices that were ever end-to-end -end encryption. Most people think when you send an email out, uh, you know, if it gets to the other side uh, and somebody goes on the other side or has that uh, handset, they're going to get it. But no, most of the NSA were intercepting these these emails uh, right midway through before it got to the other party. So, you know, uh, a government organization that just was a data a data bank of pretty much world communications just thrown in hard drives in the side of a mountain and it didn't take long after that to see blackberry's demise fall quickly and fast out of the uh, entire uh, smartphone race now some will say uh, blackberry didn't uh, you know keep up with uh, its applications and whatever but let's remember what a blackberry device was it was never about uh, it was never about you know uh, using applications uh, for other things mostly it was used for business to trust and have a trusted uh, communication and that company was a threat You've got to remember it was the monster it was the leader it was the company that was selling 80 million handsets uh, every quarter. It was, you know, a $200 share stock. And quickly after the Edward Snowden uh, fiasco happened, the company went into an absolute free fall and is completely different from what it is today. Fast forward to 2020, there's a new kid on the block and uh, that's Huawei. And uh, it is a force to be reckoned with here. <laughs> and, uh, how do you dismantle Huawei? Well, you try to go after its bank accounts. You try to go after its management. You try to go after its chip makers. You try to go after other governments around the world that uh, work with it. All these you, start a, you start a, a media campaign. Where's the outcry when Huawei was putting in 3G networks? Still active, still working. Terminals are all over the world. Where was the outcry when they were putting in 4G networks? Still there, still in, you know, the hardware is still in. Now we have 5G, and the stories that have come out from 5G have just been very interesting, to put, <laughs> put it that way. Uh, and uh, lots of conspiracy theories put out there. But here's a company that uh, is emerging, and 5G is not just, you know, Daniel, 5G is not just about speed on a phone. Uh, it's, you know, it's about latency. It's about, uh, you know, uh, I was recently watching a couple of other content creators videos where people were sitting in an office and they were using a, a dump truck uh, 4,000 kilometers away on, on a 5G network. Uh, you know, mobile operations on patients. I mean, this is very very serious stuff and these are so who feels threatened the most here and that's where this case is going yeah i think uh, 5g takes it into a whole new category with uh, infrastructure and all kinds of stuff that's going to be put on this and uh, you can be darn sure that uh, the u.s is want to is going to want to still be able to control this and um, but w the one thing we've been given enough evidence for is that um the, the u.s is not a good custodian of this kind of power they do misuse it um yeah i mean it couldn't you agree with me on this that if this main case was really about fraud, wouldn't the United States just throw a number out there like they did to HSBC? Uh, it was, I looked at my notes, it was 1.97 billion. Wouldn't they just throw out a, a number to Huawei and say, okay, guys, you know what? Um, we caught you. Uh, we have a 24 page PowerPoint presentation, We've got enough to get an indictment. Uh, can we settle on a billion and uh, everybody everybody shakes hands and walks away? 
obviously not. So uh, yeah. this number is much bigger than we think. And this is, you know, this case is clearly not about fraud. It's not about, so, it's not, and it's not about money. It's about power. It's about power. Yes. Yeah. Rightly so. Yeah. So uh, moving on, uh, because obviously uh, uh, the unfortunate thing for us as Canadians is it seems like there are two Canadians that got caught up in this too. Um, yes. So, you know, uh, the two Michaels in China, um, they, you know, the, the, the fact is that this looks like from the surface, it looks like it's a tit for tat thing. It looks like mm -hmm. this is foul play for foul play for fair play. And that, that, that's important too, because obviously grabbing Meng with all of these things, we can already see how fraudulent the case is, um, how dishonest they are with removing slides. Um, and it's all about Huawei growing too quickly, growing too fast. Um, through the open market in a fair way. So that's why I say foul play for foul play for fair play. And I don't think two wrongs make a right. I don't think they should be, China should be following this eye for an eye thing, but mm -hmm. um, this is what it is. And unfortunately with the two Michaels, the system here doesn't seem to be as transparent. So although we can talk about Mung's case, we can talk about all the details and stuff like that, but we can't do that as much for the Michaels cases because they're not no, doing, true. Uh, they're not they're not uh, coming out with uh, documents and supporting things and all this kind of stuff. Now, it, 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 the U.S. is, but a lot of it is BS. So it's like this pre uh, pretentious uh, transparency saying, well, we're completely transparent. Uh, well, except in this case, we're not going to tell you uh, what the communication looked like for national security cases. Oh, we're going to pull out these slides and everything like that. So it's a superficial version of transparency to um, maintain the illusion of rule of law and justice and right versus wrong. But on the China side, we're not we're not given any of this. They don't go through this song and dance and say, OK, we're going to provide you with these things that we put a lot of to to curate this case against these two guys. Um, so unfortunately, we can't talk about it in the same way. Um, but it does definitely does seem like it. They were caught. They were caught up in this. Now, what, what's interesting though is you showed me a picture though. Like the, 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 I thought these well, were just ordinary you know, business guys, right? But you showed yeah, me I, I, you know, I, I, and I kind of want to get into this. I mean, you know, as you're saying, the the tit for tat, the you know, uh, an eye for an eye. I think you know China was very careful and. and I'm just basing this on if if this is the hey they've got Ming uh, we need to I'm just basing it on this scenario okay I don't uh, I don't have an, uh, a chip in this game and uh, you know in, in my opinion uh, I don't like to see any of our national nationalities uh, you know especially Canadians in in a in a foreign prison it's it's not a nice thing to be no. but I think that you have two um, pretty well uh, educated pretty well diverse individuals that probably are very aware of what their situation is okay and uh, you know we're talking about you know COVID and Spaver now I just want to show you guys a photo here of um, uh, their screen if you want to pop it up or if you can pull yeah it your, I'll, I'll pull it up I'll pull it up here so um, this is um, <laughs> This is Michael Spaver having a Long Island iced tea with uh, Kim Jong Un on a. Uh, well, you see, uh, he's on board with the North Korean uh, leader's private yacht in Wonsan in September 2013. So, I, you know, he. And like I said, I if it was intentional, which it could very well be. And they said, listen, we need to uh, find a couple of individuals, uh, and I'm just saying, uh, then these guys are very capable of, you know, knowing what this process is. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're thick skin on this. Um, the other thing about, you know, COVID, um, uh, the other Michael, is that, um, you know, he was on, um, he's an ex-diplomat, and... Uh, he was a critic of Huawei, so that could have probably um, hurt him. He was uh, he was very much in um, uh, you know he there was a uh, on one of his social media uh, platforms there was a paper that was called China's Huawei should not be allowed in the UK 5G telecom, and he had commented that that was sensible advice. Right, so. Right. 
you know, well, you know I'm not saying I'm not saying that that merits uh, no, no, to put someone, you know, in pr- be, yeah, we should be careful about that because, of course, yeah, I, I mean, this is context. This is important context. An ordinary guy doesn't uh, have a, a drink and a cigar with uh, Kim Jong Un on his yacht in North Korea. This is not an ordinary guy. Uh, but for all intents and purposes, because again, the Chinese government doesn't give us much information on the case that they have against these guys. Maybe they could just come out and say the same the U.S. says and say it's because it's a national security reason. Right. And then, that would be that would be at least a little bit more intelligent because it's exactly the same argument the U.S. is giving to say that we're not going to share all of this information with you. But because of the lack of transparency, for all intents and purposes, it looks for like a tit for tat. It looks like it. It, it, it does. It, it, uh, and I and I just and I'm hoping that these these guys are you know um, I guess we just had some recent uh, correspondence through some consular action. I, I hope it was going on right. Did you see that? Apparently, if the, if their news is true, they're like somebody was communicating with them and they were talking about this global pandemic and they're like oh my god this is like a zombie movie going outside apparently they didn't if it's true they didn't even know that the pandemic was going on <laughs> i mean I, you know i'm hoping that uh, you know uh, they're being treated well and uh you know uh, that's that's the number one thing and i hope that um you know they will be given you know it's just being tied up You've got Canadian nationals, Chinese nationals tied up on something that was not, it didn't necessarily need to happen. So right. you've got two guys in jail. Now, as you say, we don't have the information. I would love to have the information on that to see yep. what it is, but yep. we're not going to get that. And all I know is that, you know, doing a little bit of, uh, you know, background on these guys, they're well seasoned. I think they're pretty strong pretty good guys. I got very, very good family support uh, behind them. Uh, you know, if one guy is, uh, you know, brave enough to have uh, Long Island's iced teas with, uh, you know, a leader of, of North Korea, I think he knows probably deep down what's going on here. And uh, it'd be interesting to hear his story uh, eventually. Uh, let's just hope that uh, this saga uh, doesn't continue to get dragged out um but we once again we don't have enough information on on what they're being necessarily charged with and that's just that's unfortunate yeah yeah and it's also unfortunate because it's not actually doing anything it's not actually getting the canadian government to uh back down from being a a u.s lapdog and and participating in the sham of a a case that's going on it's not actually doing anything so that's that's what that's what makes it so much more unfortunate is um you know but obviously I, i guess the china's sticking by their guns and uh um, yeah, and like we said, there may be a legitimate case against them, but we don't know. So the only thing we can assume right now is that's all it's about. It's hit for tap, which I don't agree with. Yeah. It's unfortunate, but it is It is what it is. And, so and, and when these things come up, when these things come up, that's what diplomacy is all about, Daniel. You send your diplomats. They send their diplomats. Right. We feel these guys are being held, uh, you know, without reason. Okay, well, we feel she is being held up. That's what diplomacy is you well, agree like, okay the, the international criminal court that, that i was talking about too that, that's exa- they are punishing even the family members of the people in those courts who uh, want to question war crimes in afghanistan they're also implicating people they're also pulling people in that have nothing to do with it all they are they're family members of people that wanted to do their jobs and bring justice to the people that uh, that, that, that america tortured and brought atrocities to in afghanistan those family members are being, you know, and they've got nothing to do with it also. Now, granted, they're not you know, being locked up, but they're being punished, they're being sanctioned, they're not allowed in the U.S. anymore and all this kind of stuff. Like you said, it's diplomacy. This is what's going on. I don't like it. I don't like any of it, but unfortunately... I don't like it. And, and, and this really, you know, hurts the credibility of Canada. I mean, we have a large Asian community, a very large Asian community here in Canada. And, um, you know, it, it goes right down to where, where we were at the start of this conversation. Look who's under house arrest here. If this was an American national, Tim Cook, sitting in a house, well, you know, uh, if he had a house in Vietnam, uh, uh, waiting to be extradited by the prosecutors in Russia. And Vietnam, what would... What have they got to play in any of this? America would be all over this. And this is what we've got. What on earth is Canada doing? Why are we involved with this? 
they're, Why? They're, they're, yeah, they're playing. They're playing the entire. They're just absolute puppets to the U.S. They're playing the whole game. They've gotten onto this ethnic minority stuff. Also, you know, I, I saw a, a video that went semi-viral of a MP from the northern regions of Canada, um, of uh, uh, one of the the, the native uh, kind of peoples um, of Canada, and she got up. She's a twenty-something-year-old NDP uh, MP, and said, "I have been waiting my whole life." for Canada to f f fulfill its promises. Our houses are falling apart. Our, our, our schools are in shambles. And, you know, we are a marginalized community in Canada. Actually, my dad does this. My dad is a professor of this stuff. He's a, a, a PhD and he's written an entire book on uh, oppressive, uh, uh, anti-oppressive social work practices. Mm -hmm. And he said, actually, as much as you hear about the um, African-American community in the US, by every metric, by uh, health, by poverty, by everything, the, the lives of native uh, Canadians uh, are worse off than African Americans in, in the US. And it's pretty universally uh, accepted that the US, there is a problem with the treatment of African Americans. It's even worse for natives. So I thought, this is a viral video. I, I, wow, this is really good. She was so well-spoken. Maybe Canada's gonna do a, a, something about it. Two weeks later, Canada comes out talking about the apparent uh, e problems with ethnic minorities in China. And it's like, oh, hold on a second. It's like, you're jumping on this US narrative, which I've spent a lot of time talking about and debunking, and you're just totally ignoring your own ethnic minority local you know, person who said, we have some serious problems here. I even actually invited her on Twitter. I sent her a message. I said, you know what? You should come over to Tibet and you should see the schools here. You should see how they're uh, teaching uh, Tibetan language, music, arts, typing. Um, how they're bringing back old Tibetan cultures like uh, Tanka uh, paintings that have been lost for 500 years. And I thought that would be actually really amazing to have a native Canadian, uh, you know, indigenous person come over here and say, whoa, hold on a second. We don't get anything like this in Canada. You know, that would have been really a, a, an entertaining thing to see. Um, but no, they're just jumping onto all of these um, uh, US-based agenda things. I went off on a little bit of a, a way off topic uh, uh, rant there, but there's a lot to be upset about as Canadians. You know, we jokingly, as, grew, as we grew up, you know, it was a little bit of ribbing and stuff like that. But you know, when we were kids growing up in Canada, one of the things that we used to be proud of is that in the War of 1812, we, 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 we burnt down the White House, you know? You know, there's some disputes about exactly how it happened, but we grew up saying, yeah, you know, that's our little thing. Because we, we are, you know, on the world stage, we are quite insignificant compared to the mm -hmm. US, but that was one thing we had. They tried to attack us. We have Laura Secord who were, you know, <laughs> did that run to, to, to notify um, the authorities, the, the army, so that they could fight back against the Americans. There's, of course, the Laura Secord Chocolate Company, which has since been sold to Americans, which is uh, quite ironic. But we grew up with this pride. And then when you actually look into this stuff and you see what's going on, we're like, we're, we're, not, only, we're not only nothing, we're just an absolute puppet to the US. And it's such a, a shame, it's such a disappointment as a Canadian. Yeah, we're, you know, and, and, and this brings it back to this, this trial here. Um, so we shouldn't be involved. I, yeah. I, I go off on these tangents. Let's pull this back in. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm you know, we, we let's pull it back in. <laughs> you know, we we shouldn't. Th this case, we, we shouldn't be involved in this, and this this shouldn't really, you know. There was comments from the current administration that, well, uh, if a trade deal comes down, uh, you know, this could be part of a trade deal too. Uh, I mean, holding someone's life in limbo because of a trade deal, uh, you know, that those words were said, you know, and, uh, you know, it's 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 bothering and it's just bothering on on many levels. It's like how many people have fallen through the cracks that didn't get the media attention here. That is the worrying part. How many people are sitting down in other jails, you know, especially in the United States, or potentially uh, have an extradition hearing uh, going to the U.S.? I mean, it's it's frightening because you could pretty much be nabbed anywhere in the world on a U.S. 24-page, 25-page document like this and be arrested. If you're a nobody, you're done. And you look at even, like I said, bringing, it's talking again, Julian Assange is not a nobody. That was huge. That was, this is absolutely huge. How much media coverage is it getting in the West? How many details do people know about the extradition case? Nobody knows about it. I put like surveys out on my Twitter also. I'm like, how much coverage are you getting? And they're like, oh shoot, we didn't even know the, the extradition hearing already started. And it's like, somebody that big, somebody that did so, something that important, somebody that made us realize there are war criminals on the loose, American war criminals and British war criminals, even he 
is not getting any coverage. Imagine if you're just an ordinary guy that said the wrong thing against the U.S. or did the wrong thing or crossed them the wrong way. You're done. There's mm -hmm. nothing you can do. There's and I, I, do. I think a lot of this has got to do with, and you know, you're you're pretty up to date on the histories and the dynasties that that uh, were in China. You know, China's risen and it's fallen many times. You know, I think we're on the fifth fifth rise here. And I think we're going to see it, uh, you know, over the next 50 to 100 years, it's going to continue to rise. And then eventually it will either flatten or fall down again and there'll be somebody else take over. But it's on the rise right now. Uh, our neighbors, and, you know, as Canadians and the Americans as our neighbors, uh, feel threatened. And uh, rightfully so and understandably so, but, you know, as, as, as I was listening to uh, Cyrus Jensen's uh, podcast the other night, you know, China's willing to sit down and uh, bridge the gap and let's yeah. do business together and uh, let's, uh, let's move forward. We both win. Uh, why does it have to be us against you? They always have been. Actually, if you look at, um, you know, uh, Edgar, uh, Edgar Snow uh, or you look at any of these people who documented the uh, CPC during their rise, uh, I mean, he went with them on their, you know, he's parts, parts of the Long March and, and, and he knows that in detail. He was one of the only journalists who was covering what was one of the biggest revolutions of the century. Uh, Mao had been saying over and over from the beginning, America should be our friends. We should work together with them. And he reached out to the administration there also to, to have a conversation with them. And they, they absolutely rejected him. They were still stuck on this Ch Chiang Kai-shek guy because he was going to Christianize and Americanize uh, 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 China in, in the American way. Um, but yeah, they've always been open to this. And then the other problem too is, is we already have seen over these endless wars, over these uh, shoddy extraditions, over uh, the <laughs> war crimes that the, uh, the U.S. has committed, they have not been a good custodian of global power. I don't necessarily think that uh, China should take a position where they have the same kind of global power that uh, America has now, but at least having some sort of a fragmentation, at least, you know, uh, having multiple parties who can hold each other to account is something we desperately need when you look at what the U.S. has been responsible for. It's a, a perpetual war state um, that, 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 that spies on and persecutes even its own allies. I mean, you know, America has a very, very... Uh good way of uh supporting countries when it wants to and i think it has it has its ability here with china it really does like i you know you're having this it's us against them and i really think you know we have the opportunity here to turn the page on history and really bring both of these countries together to say wait a minute guys you know you've got this and we've got this and can't we both work together to really really advance because if you get both of these countries together you know I, I i mean you would get so much accomplished and it would be amazing you wouldn't have to spend so much money militarily to arm yourself i mean the lives of people could uh, you know accelerate that might be true. Problem. True. The military true. Industrial complex is an important part of the American economy. And I understand that, yeah. but another thing that's very important uh, about the economy that we're missing here is this global communication is massive, much bigger than what we think. Now there is a reason why Huawei has been designing its own uh, software system, its own platform, and just to give the viewers example, where I'm going with this is currently right now you have basically two choices. You have the Apple iStore and you have the Android Play Store, right? Okay, we'll say that they have probably 95 to 97% of the market, maybe a couple of small players, the black phones and whatever, they have their own, uh, their own internal software uh, and uh, something like that. Now, the interesting point is the United States government says, fine, anybody doing business with Huawei, uh, you got to get approval. Uh, if not, you're going to be blocked. Uh, all these countries around the world, uh, you know, Sweden is on the on the train now. Uh, you know, United Kingdom, Australia, Canada, don't go with Huawei. Okay, well, who do we go with? Well, we'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> so then you you try to dismantle the hardware side. Then they go to Google and they say very clearly, uh, don't allow the Google Play Store on your on the Huawei devices. Now, I have a Huawei device that doesn't have the Google Play Store. Funny enough, yes, I, 
I, I'm, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm getting on with life without the Google Play Store. Very simple. It's very easy. Now, um, what gets interesting here is you got to remember how much money's involved here, okay? And I don't think Google wants to be shut out of the Chinese market, but they are razor thin close, Daniel, to being shut out of the Chinese market. Because once you turn the lights off on the Google Play Store in China, you have shut down probably, I don't know, a billion potential customers that were using your, your Play Store or using your software or licensing your software. That's gone. And you're going to have to come up to your developers and you're going to have to say to all these individuals, small companies, medium-sized companies uh, that make these applications for these mobile phones, handsets, and say, you know what, guys, um, the biggest mobile market and the most advanced mobile in the market, uh, we don't have access to anymore. And it's done and it's finished and it's closed and it's finished overnight. Now, the viewers might be saying, well, you know, why did we really care? You know, why is this so important? Uh, who cares about, uh, you know, China having their own software? Well, obviously someone's paying attention to TikTok and someone's paying attention to, you know, Doyin uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's flagship companies that own these companies. Somebody's paying attention to AliExpress and Alibaba. Somebody's paying attention to WeChat. Yes, because these are now applications coming out not from the American soil, but from the Asian soil. And they're picking up steam. They're becoming revenue uh, machines. And app developers are saying, wait a minute, we made money on this social platform, but we can make a lot of money on this social platform. And that's where the America loses its grip. It loses it now from the software side and they, they lose the hardware side. So this is a big deal. This is much deeper than Wang. This 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 goes right into pretty much any uh, company that's listed on the Nasdaq right now. I mean, if you're if you're sitting there wagering, is is America gonna block uh, WeChat? Is America gonna block um, you know TikTok? It might sound like a you know a funny thing to the average person. No no big deal. We don't care about TikTok or we don't care about these applications. Well, if Google is gone on a billion handsets that's going to be felt and here's the and here's the last comment i want to make on that yeah apple just announced in september was it september or it's new phone that's coming out right i'm not happy following it well apple just announced its new 5g phone coming out do you really think that that 5g apple phone is geared towards the north american market that hardly has 5G penetration on it anywhere? No, that phone is geared toward the Asian market where 5G networks like where I'm at are everywhere here and they've been here for over a year. So that just shows you that we are in very delicate times here. Well, I wanna, uh, I wanna comment on a few of those things because um, yeah, the, 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 one of the important things to note is that America's of course censoring all of these uh, uh, companies that are becoming bigger than American social media com companies. And this isn't a warning just to China, it's a warning to anybody. If you're a country mm -hmm. and you're gonna create a social media platform that's gonna outperform the American ones, watch out, you're gonna be on their hit list. It just so happens that a lot of innovation is happening in China. Now, uh, the reason for that too, is that all of these American platforms like Twitter and Facebook and stuff like that, people think they're free, people think they're open and stuff like that. No, they follow NSA censorship rules and stuff like that. You look at when, um, uh, when uh, America killed um, Soleimani, when they when they killed him in Iraq, he was on a peace mission from Iran to have a peace mission together with uh, the Saudi Arabian officials. This is a potential event, a potential meeting that could have brought more peace and stability to the region. And uh, 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 the U.S. had drone attacked him. They killed him. Now, nobody knows in the U.S., hardly anybody knows that he was on his way to a peace mission. He was on his way to a peace talk and that this was a completely uh, a set up thing. Hardly anybody knows that the Iraqi parliament condemned the U.S. for that and, the U and they wanted the U.S. out of Iraq. And they said, no, sorry, that's not how your democracy works. Sure, you have democracy now in a parliament, but you still have to listen to everything we say. Nobody knows that. But the people who wanted to educate people on that, on Twitter, on Instagram, on uh, Facebook, they were removed. They were removed off of the platform. 
And uh, Facebook even had an official announcement that came out saying that in order to follow U.S. laws and sanctions, we're removing anybody who is, it looks to be, um, uh, you know, talking about Iran. I can't remember the way that they uh, uh, empathized or empathized with Iran. Even you empathize with Iran, you would be removed off of the platform. <laughs> mm -hmm. So now here comes TikTok. Is TikTok going to do the same thing? Or are they going to say, uh, that's kind of BS? Because you know what was interesting was there was actually um, there was actually a Syrian official who was talking about it on Twitter, and uh, he he was I think he was arguing with a, an American official, and they the, the the Syrian official got removed. So he moved over to Weibo, and he started tweeting in Chinese on Weibo, and all of a sudden you had an American official and a Syrian official talking about this Iranian issue on Weibo in Chinese because it all of a sudden became the most free place on earth to have a discussion about what happened in uh, Iraq. It was it was the, the it was an incredibly ironic situation, but that's what it's about too. It's about control and it's about power and it's about all these things we were just talking about. But let, let's um, if you've got some stuff to add, I know we hit the one hour mark, and I want to keep mm -hmm. it uh, digestible as possible. If we if we wrap this up in about five minutes, if you've got some stuff you want to add or any important uh, additional context. Well, you know the the case continues in, in for Ming here in in Canada, and um, you know as more days and more cross examine examinations going on of the authorities they're just they're stumbling and uh if i'm a judge on this case this would have been this this should be it this she this stuff should have, you know this case should be thrown out a long time ago but now with all the you know the inaccuracies in this and all the you know wow we remember you know they asked the policeman and the arresting authority do you do you, do you really feel that she had no attachments to Canada uh, well I wasn't really briefed on it but you signed the document well yes but now that I know that she had a couple of homes in Canada I wouldn't have thought that she would have been a you know a uh, you know a threat uh, you know and it's just they're stumbling. And they're trying to make it up as they go along, and I don't think uh, it's it's going to work. I think that uh, it would be nice that uh, if this case gets kind of chucked out, thrown out, uh, she gets to go back to her business. Diplomacy takes diplomacy happens, and uh, you know, uh, you know, that's that's what diplomacy is about, uh, and that should accelerate it. That you know, our prime minister should be right on there because. Businesses are being affected. Even the farmers are being affected by this in Canada due to, uh, you know, restrictions of uh, exports of canola, you know, tariffs and, and, and so on and so forth. I mean, from, from China, uh, you know, banning some of the stuff. So it's it's turned into a political circus for, for both um for both, well, three countries. Uh, one not really being affected at all, but two really getting uh, beat up. You know, I, I want to make a point. Um, you know, once again, on why this is so important, is that uh, you know, I was watching a news report yesterday, and a lot of people say, "Well, you know, you're not going to get much of the uh, you know balanced news coming out of Asia." And uh, this program was uh, about the Wuhan uh, epidemic and what was going on. It was a two-part series uh, called Frontline on CGTN. Okay. They didn't hold anything back in that two-hour series. But it did show that uh, the technology uh, and uh, you know the the leadership and the technology all bounded together to you know fight this epidemic in in, in China, and you know we have uh, we're, do we really have the time right now to be flooding our court courts with this type of stuff? and uh, coming down hard on economies and uh, doing this while we're in the middle of a global pandemic where companies like Huawei could help other countries around the world implement a way to combat this. You know, as we're speaking today, France yesterday hit 50,000 people were infected in one day in France and over 500 people died. And I just think instead of, you know, bowing down and uh you know polluting the courts with all this kind of stuff you imagine holding tim cook in prison right now or at least under house arrest in another country wouldn't he be better behind the back of his desk and hey if huawei did something wrong give them a penalty make them pay for what they've done wrong or anywhere where they have caused people some financial loss hit them and they'll pay the bill just like every other company has done and move on but here we are. 
you, you, yeah, you would think that that would be the route they would take, um, and uh, we'd probably it would probably be even less clear than it is now. When you've actually got somebody under arrest um, in the U.S. who'd been who I mean in Canada, um, and even now when all of the details should be coming out about what Huawei did wrong, we're still left with saying uh, what. What exactly? Like, no, they didn't misrepresent themselves. No, they didn't request the U.S. dollars. This was a, you know, there's all kinds of red flags here. Um, but uh, you're right, though. With that aside, uh, they should still should have done it the way that they usually do it. But there's a uh, there's a hidden agenda here. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah. And, and and it should take a lot to you know for her to be shipped down there to the United States. You know, it, the burden of proof is, is is not on, you know, it's got to be on the, the prosecutor's side. And he, there are holes all over the place here. Yeah, so when, let's when hope that happens. Yeah, when and if that happens, um, you know, on this kind of shoddy evidence without releasing the, the, docu the basic documents about the communication that happened leading up to her arrest, um, it's going to be, it's going to be an absolute disaster. I can only imagine how much worse um, the, this Cold War, uh, the, 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 these uh, and these tensions are going to um, have. Um, it's really, it's really actually kind of scary to think. But about I, it you know, I, I encourage everybody to, you know, if you've got a little bit of time on Sunday, uh, just to briefly go through the 25-page indictment and and uh, you kind of pick that apart and see if that's worth holding one of the largest world telecom uh, man, uh, you know, uh, I guess. Uh, Owners and and part management or whatever her position just is. Example. Just use the yes. example in reverse. Change the, exactly. Uh, change Canada to Vietnam. Change the U.S. to Russia. Change Meng Wanzhou to Tim Cook. And then yeah. ask yourself. Ask yourself from that position. I think it's going to be obvious. But you know what? There's going to mm -hmm. be more. Uh, uh, obviously, there's more trials coming up. And I think what we should do is because this was really interesting. Um, and Thank you're obviously you. staying on top of this, so we can. Uh, uh, we can do another follow-up one later on, but um, I think maybe let's keep this one pretty digestible, or just a, just over the hour mark. Um, yeah, and what we'll do is we'll also we'll also put a video in here that uh, a lot of people have been asking. You know, they've been seeing in the media that they're saying, "Well, there's a reason why they want Ming out there," and because you know Huawei is owned by the CCP. Uh, I did uh, pull up a video. I can either play it now or I can play it later. Up to you. Uh, it talks about the ownership of the company? Yeah, it's it's about a two-minute video, and it really goes into detail on um, who is behind Huawei. Maybe that's a good note to finish off on. Let's take, take a look. All right, here we go. Huawei has been repeatedly accused of being owned or funded by the Chinese government. Here are the facts. Huawei is employee-owned. 96,000 current and former staff own 100% of the company. That leaves exactly 0% in the hands of the Chinese government. Of course, ownership is only one way to fund a company. Let's look at the other ways. Cash gifts. Yes, Huawei does get some government subsidies for doing R&D. From 2009 to 2018, that money amounted to 0.3% of Huawei's sales. Without the decimal, it's 0%. Low taxes. Tech companies often get tax breaks for their R&D spending, and so does Huawei. Huawei spends billions of dollars in R&D every year. The standard corporate tax rate in China is 25%, but as a tech company, Huawei pays only about 15%. In the US, the corporate tax rate is 35%, but the US Bureau of Economic Analysis reports that most companies pay only 16%. Some famous ones pay much less than that. Does the Chinese government hand cash to our customers? Okay, Chinese government agencies offer loans to some Huawei customers abroad. Customers must repay that money, so it's not a gift. And besides, the countries where our main competitors are based also offer export financing. The fourth and last option would be low-interest loans from Chinese government banks. Well, we don't use bank loans a lot. And in 2018, only 25% of our loans were in Chinese yuan. The numbers vary by year, but roughly three-fourths of our loans are from foreign banks. And if you make a weighted average of the interest rate on all our loans and bonds, we pay more in interest than others in our industry. What you just heard isn't made up. Since the year 2000, our financial figures have been audited annually by KPMG, one of the world's most respected accounting firms. And recently, we also had a finance professor from Columbia Business School in New York produce an expert opinion of our sources of funding for an official filing with the U.S. Federal Communications Commission. 
The cash generated by our businesses is actually our main source of funding, the expert found. We sell a lot of excellent products, so money is coming in constantly. We could get by without any other source of financing than our sales. Next time you hear someone claim that Huawei is state-funded, check the facts behind the allegations. There might not be any. And if you want to learn more about who we are, check out our website. <laughs> well, a cute that little piece that I thought I would show you. I, I, that, that's, you know, that's actually really good. And they and they and they and they uh, go head on to the things like about the tax credits and stuff like that. Because of course, I mean, all other like look at when Air Canada was uh, bailed out and stuff like that. I think other companies overseas who are important uh, national companies are always uh, supported by the government and bailed yeah. out like that. But in, in relationship, when you look at how, how much they're receiving or not receiving, it, it looks like pennies compared to what you would see like a, an American bank bailout after the uh, mortgage crisis or something. Uh, and in our in our next in in our next uh, podcast, I'll bring up the other the other video where it does a breakdown on who actually owns the company. It's in a similar video oh, like you know that. What? But I, I thought, thought that, that I can tell you firsthand. Uh, my my wife's uh, classmates. So she came to visit us uh, in like is it about a month ago or so or two months ago? She works for Huawei, right. and uh, she was talking about uh, what it's like working there and uh, how there's how there's so much room to climb the corporate ladder and the employee share programs. I was like, this is cr like crazy. It's a really good company for employees. So in terms of that employee share thing that I heard about, uh, that, that it's employee owned, uh, that's absolutely correct. I've heard that firsthand from people who work at Huawei, but very interesting and video. Let's, yeah, go ahead. Yep. Go ahead. And over 20,000 people work in just in the R&D department for the company. 20,000. Yeah. No, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> it's an interesting topic. Let's uh, follow up on this, especially as we get more. Sounds good. In the case coming out. But thank you so much for joining me. And uh, let's chat next time about this. We're also going to be on a live stream coming up soon about uh, uh, about the uh, a, a, a tour guide who, who works in uh, North Korea. Or yes. So everybody stay tuned for that, too. You'll see us together again on that. All right. Well, thank you very much for having me, Daniel. And... Uh, Thank you. Thanks, man. Chat soon. Cheers.